just making sure you're here. We're always trying to get the timing right. Um, hello, here. everybody. Yeah. I know. Good. I'm glad. My name is Ann Merchant. And of course, we want to welcome you to our virtual film screening and talk back for the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation's Sundance award winning film, Son of Monarchs. So, of course, to make sure you were here and you are joining me at the top of the event, as always, I am joined by. I'm Rick Glover. I'm the Program Director of the Science and Entertainment Exchange, a program of the National Academy of Sciences. Exactly. And of course, film screenings are always one of our more popular um, formats. And so we were really glad to be able to do this. We've done a few of them in the 18 months since we've been doing our virtual um, programming. And so we were really glad that we were able to do this. And of course, if history is any guide, I think that this is going to be a really good conversation. And we're really glad to have with us filmmaker Alexi Gambi, who has been a longtime friend of the Science and Entertainment Exchange. We've known him for um, many years now because we, we originally met him because he is the founder of the Imagine Science Film Festival. And so we've had a long association with Alexi in that particular regard. But we also, of course, have with us two scientists who were advisors to the film as Alexi put this movie together. Um, and we have Nipon Patel and we have L.O.D. Garen with us as well. So we're going to have a great conversation. And of course, we couldn't have the conversation if we didn't have our fantastic moderator, Carla Easter. And so we all had to sign on as uh, Carla for technical reasons today. And so will the, with the real um, Carla uh, stand up, we're going to have her coming on later and that's going to be terrific. Um, so we'll have her with us. And so as we start our program, I often turn to the work of the National Academies to provide a little bit of context um, for our events. We don't have any actual work on monarch butterflies. Um, and so I don't have that. But what I do have is um, a lot of work that has to do with climate change. And we know that a lot of pressures on monarch butterflies these days for their migration and for their very existence comes from climate change. Um, and as we sit on the eve of COP26, which is the UN um, Climate Change Conference of Parties, and that kicks off in Scotland, I think on Sunday, um, the, we have a president's um, statement that is on our website, and I think Jeff is going to put that in the chat for you from Marsha McNutt. And she looks back at the body of work from the institution citing the Charney report, which from, was from the late 1970s, calling attention to the perils of climate change um, and warning about the doubling of CO2 emissions. Um, and then, of course, though, looking forward with much more optimism about the ways that we can come together and can and can actually make change um, if, we, if we do this as a global community, much as we've done um, with, the, with the pandemic. Um, but of course, that means that maybe there's some hope for the monarchs and hope for our species and other species on the planet. But the other way that we like to look at this is through stories. And that's where the Science and Entertainment Exchange comes in. So Rick, I'm gonna hand it over to you so you can talk a little bit about the exchange. That's right. If you're a writer, director, studio exec executive, actor, uh, storyteller of any kind, really, and you have a question about science while you're making a feature film, TV show, video game, piece of mass media, you can give us a call and we'll connect you to a, an expert in the field for free who can answer your questions. And we've done this over 3,400 times since we opened our doors. Um, and we've done it for documentaries as well as feature films. If you are a STEM professional, and this is the first that you've heard of us, and you're like, what is this? I just wanted to see some <laughs> monarchs. Uh, please give us a call. We're always interested in these events that actually brought in a lot of volunteers. If you're a storyteller, you have a question about science, uh, please don't uh, hesitate to call us 844-NEED-SCI. Um, I wanna to thank today's sponsor, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, without uh, whose help and support we would uh, not be doing this programming. I also wanna thank uh, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Uh, we get major support from them um, as well. And from individual donors like many of you, thank you to everybody who donated for this event in particular. We really appreciate it and we take all that funding and we put it right back into these events to do more of them better and you know, better internet, all of it. Um, so I also want to thank Courtney, Sachi, Jeff, Ameche, and all the team at the NAS without whose help we couldn't be doing these events. Um, Jeff in particular for, because uh, Sachi's off today, so thank you Jeff for your help in doing some of the stuff Sachi normally does. Uh, today, we're going to have a conversation in a minute, a moderated conversation. If at any point you have a question, please put it right down here in the Q&A and I will be passing it along surreptitiously to our fearless moderator. 
if you're quite if we don't get to your question i'm very sorry we always get more questions than we have time for and uh you know i am the editor so it's my fault not carla's so just be aware you can you can get mad at me sorry um let's see uh before i do my rabbit hole i want to wish happy birthday to my dad it's his 75th birthday today happy birthday dad you watch all our absolutely. events absolutely yes for doing that. absolutely so. happy birthday um, and finally, my rabbit hole. Um, I found this Monarch Watch. It's a nonprofit working towards the conservation of monarch butterflies with a bunch of tangible steps that uh, you can do on their website to try to help monarchs along as they migrate across, uh, they migrate something like 3,000 miles. I may be corrected on that, but I believe that's right. Um, so, Anne, back to you. Thank you very much. And my rabbit hole, I actually um, was looking at the butterfly effect, which it turns out was a um, it was something that was based on a question asked by a scientist, a meteorologist, Edward Lorenz, who posed a question at the AAAS meeting 45 years ago. Does the flap of a butterfly's wing um, affect uh, the weather in Brazil if there was a tornado in Texas. And, and he was really looking at the models that he was creating for, um, for weathers, the computer models. And he found that it was just like very small changes in that model could produce radically different outcomes. And so he was looking at the unpredictability of the, of the weather models. And, and this later became the basis for chaos theory. So I thought that was very interesting. And an so. extremely accurate movie called The Butterfly Effect. I don't know well, if you've seen you that go. one. That's right. Basically exactly. a documentary. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, so, so we are very, very happy, as I said before, to have Carla Easter with us. I remember when I was first introduced to Carla, I was told, well, she's very awesome, but mostly she's just the most amazing human ever. And I, I would agree with that. So we are big fans of the Smithsonian Institution in general, but I am a personal fan of the National Museum of Natural History. It is always one of my, has been one of my favorite museums. And so we were really glad when Carla join them. And we are very glad that Carla is here with us doing this conversation because we couldn't think of a better moderator for this. So now it is time for the real Carla Easter to please stand up um, <laughs> because Rick and I both had to come in under your login to get here today and we didn't want to abandon you. So, so if there could be three Carlas, that wasn't going to be good. We just needed the one Carla and you're it. So we're going to turn this over to you, Carla, and we are so glad that you're here. And I think you actually are at the museum today is that right i i am at the museum today yes i'm Excellent. here <laughs> and i'm at work today too this is my office and i have my badge on to prove it so from one office to the other we're, we're neighbors i can practically see you from here so i'm going to let you take it from here carla wonderful well thank you ann and rick and i apologize for my earlier entry i was just so excited to get started when i heard my name i felt like i should be on so I'm delighted to be moderating today's uh, Son of Monarchs film talkback. Uh, Son of Monarchs is, uh, as many of you know, a Mexican-American narrative that premiered at Sundance in 2021 in the next category and was awarded the Sloan Feature Film Prize. It received the Grand Jury Prize of the New American Competition at the 2021 International, Seattle International Film Festival and Screen Daily called the film a visually flamboyant film, a daring mosaic which floats like a butterfly. And so for today's discussion, I'm going to do some brief introductions of our three distinguished panelists. To begin with, Alexi Gambi is a French Venezuelan filmmaker and biologist. His, film combi his films combine documentary and fiction, often embracing animal perspectives and experimenting with new forms of scientific storytelling. Son of Monarchs is his second film and it delves into issues of identity, immigration and evolution. So please join us, Alexi. Hi everyone, Wonderful. Thanks. thanks for, yeah, thanks for having me, Carla. Excited Wonderful. to be here. Our next panelist is Elodie Geddon. Elodie holds an affiliation with New York University, where she was previously director of the Center for Genomics and Systems Biology and a professor of biology and global public health until 2020. She is a MacArthur Foundation Fellow, a Cavill Frontier of Science Fellow, and an American Academy of Microbiology Fellow. 
So welcome, Elodie. Hi. And last but not least, Nipam H. Patel is director of the Marine Biology Biological Laboratory, or MBL, and a professor at the University of Chicago. He joined the MBL in 2018 from University of California, Berkeley. And he is a developmental biologist who is interested in the changes that have occurred during evolution and to generate animal diversity. His lab investigates the cellular and genetic basis for structural coloration and transparency in butterflies and moths and the evolutionary diversification of appendage patterning. So welcome, Nipam. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Wonderful. So I know that people are anxious to ask questions, but as the moderator, I will uh, ask the first question. And this film, which is absolutely amazing, and as I described in the introduction, has a lot of intersections between science and fiction. And so I'd like to ask each of the panelists if you'd like to talk a little bit about what that intersection between science and fiction means for you. And, and again, how it has impacts potentially on the science that you do, and maybe about how science is um, communicated to the public. So I, I will ask anybody to go first, and I will just, I'll let you start off with the discussion. You're going to have to point fingers because... <laughs> Well, well, since Elodie, since you started, we'll have you all right. go first. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, you know, I'm a um, molecular biologist and molecular virologist, and uh, you often see, you know, and the fiction side of things is that, you know, what we do can be really boring on a day-to-day -day basis. And, uh, and so conveying the uh, accuracy is, is very difficult. And so, you know, a lot of TV shows or movies do not convey accuracy very much, although there are some that are that are very good. Um, but so, it, you know, it, I've had this discussion with some of you before that putting this together, the science and the fiction together can be really complicated when you're telling a story, but scientists are storytellers too. So um, I see in, in Alexi's, um, movie he did that very well actually talking about his movie directly where he tried to really bring the, the scientists to help with the the storytelling so that there was accuracy but uh trying to meld it really well and uh, and as a typical scientist i really get annoyed when accuracy is off uh when i watch something so i don't know if that answered your question carla Absolutely. There are no wrong answers. <laughs> that, that, that's perfect. So maybe I'll go to Nipon. What, what are your thoughts on those intersections between fiction and science? Yeah, so I mean, I think we're all, um, you know, used to seeing science documentaries as a way to explain science to the public, and they do a great job doing that. But, you know, it's great to draw people in with a story. And, you know, sometimes that can be a real story about a discovery in science. But I think it's fantastic to have a story that's a fictional story, right? That has somebody you can relate to, a, you know, a plot. And in this case, like a really overarching set of interesting themes that intersect all sorts of societal issues. But then at the same time, to bring actual science into it. And I think that really draws the public in a way that's very different from documentary. And, you know, and our goal as scientists is to, you know, obviously make discoveries, but those discoveries don't mean anything if we don't communicate them to the world. And we spend a lot of time communicating our discoveries to other scientists, but it's really vital nowadays that we communicate those discoveries to the public. And a vehicle like the movie that you've, that you've all watched is a great way to do that without a documentary style, right? It's a different way to do it and it's fantastic to see. Thank you. Alexis, how, how, I mean, you were the filmmaker on this. So again, this has been sort of part of your aesthetic for a long time. So what does this intersection mean for you? Well, I think, you know, I think both documentary and fiction have, you know, my, my argument is that documentary fiction are, are very similar to each other in many ways. And they both have both the, they can both be mis, misrepresented, mispre, misrepresenting science 
and also um, providing accurate science. So I think um, what's beautiful, what, what Nepam was mentioning, what's beautiful about fiction, although, you know, documentary is also storytelling as well. You know, there's a, there's a strong storytelling device in, in documentary. And some people would argue that documentary shouldn't have story, right? that there's something like, you know, kind of going against that. Um, but I think that um, what's interesting about fiction is that you can kind of take all of these elements and bring them together. And with science, you can subliminally, you can kind of incorporate the science into a larger arc, a larger story. And people can experience a film without necessarily knowing that it's a science film, but you can kind of implant these elements and, and draw connections between, you know, between family trauma, between, you know, childhood, between memory. And so fiction, you know, I always find that in, in my work, I, I start doing research as a documentarian and translating that into, into fiction. And sometimes that means, you know, creating scenes. Sometimes that means creating dreams. Um, and I think there's something really beautiful about that. But as Elodie was saying, you, you have to be careful at, at how you fictionalize or what are the elements that you're willing to go. Um, and I think in my work, I tend to have scientists help me into the fiction to some extent. So they kind of, they're the chaperones that, that kind of give me the ideas for the fiction. That, that, that's awesome. I, I think again, for me, accessibility is what I saw in this film was the accessibility of the science through the storytelling that you did, which made um, that intersection between the science and the fiction incredibly powerful. But I, I have some questions that are coming in already. So the first one uh, is directed at you, Alexi. Um, Martha asked, was the film based on a true story and what inspired it? Music in the back. Now, um, I think, you know, the, what, what inspired me to make the film, I think uh, my work oftentimes starts with an animal. You know, I'm, I'm very interested in the animal as a metaphor to speak about other elements, speak about, you know, of course, science, politics, culture. Um, you know, my first film was about fruit flies. It was about the birth of genetics in New York in, in the 1920s, this lab called the Fly Room. And, and so this was, a, the monarch butterfly was, was, was my obsession for a while because it was linked to, um, you know, conversations about immigration. People were identifying with the monarch because it had no borders. Um, of course, there's all the issues about it being an endangered species about, you know, it involving a cooperation between multiple countries to preserve that migration. And actually, I, I usually start my work by interviewing scientists. One of the first people that I spoke to was Nepam. Um, very, very early on in the process of making even short films that were, you know, kind of the, the precursor, you know, almost like precursor tissue, like primordial tissue before making the feature film. And I just sit with, you know, with Nip I sat with Nepom and I asked him about his research, his work, his life as well. And, and I start taking these elements and then, and then incorporating them into the film. And then I spent some time in Mexico. Um, and so the monarch butterfly was a symbol for, you know, the work that Nepom was doing on color and patterning. Then monarch butterflies represent the souls of the dead in Mexico. Monarch is also a symbol for immigration. And so all of these elements create like a mosaic and then of course, then I start building the characters that, uh, but it starts with the, with the insects. And then, you know, like the humans are, are kind of like second, second priority. So, so yeah. Right. Thank you. So the next question is one that I would have asked myself, um, but it is Jennifer asks, how did the idea for the monarch pigment tattoo come about? And could it actually be done? So I'll throw that out there. I don't know if Elodie and Nipom also want to, you know, provide well, I, some thoughts on that as well. I, I can mention where it came from. I, I, I think I, I met Nipom first and then Nipom opened me up to the field of butterfly scientists in, in the U.S. and I became sort of adopted into that family. And I, one of the scientists that I time with is Bob Reed at Cornell. And, uh, and Bob works on, you know, on CRISPR and butterfly patterning. And I asked him in a conversation about CRISPR and his work, I asked him like, what is one of the craziest things you've thought of doing? And he's the one who told me about the, about the tattoo. He said, wouldn't it be great if we could take that pigment and inject it into our, into our skin? And I thought, you know, if it's coming from a scientist, then it's my responsibility as a filmmaker to 
to like enact those dreams. Like I, you know, it's almost like I'm the filmmaker that should kind of fulfill the dreams of the scientist. And of course it's not possible um, and no, nobody should do that. And, uh, but I like playing with this kind of, you know, because the film has this accuracy, but I like playing with this idea that these moments are almost like, you know, dreams or fantasies. And of course it relates to color. It relates to race, the color of our skin identifying with who we are and so and so that was kind of the the idea but i don't know if <laughs> napalm and ellie want to definitely it's it's not a not recommended yeah I'd, I'd agree with that but you know it's a it's a fascinating idea and of course there are some commonalities so the black pigment in butterflies is melanin it's the same thing that most animals use many many animals use to create black pigment and so we understand how to make that i think one of the fun things to think about though is that the pigments that a butterfly would use the problem would be that your body would break that down pretty easily. And so you actually have to find things that your body's not going to destroy with ease, right? If you want a tattoo. But if you're thinking about a temporary tattoo, again, I, I agree with Alexi, you don't want to be doing this, but it's interesting to think about the chemistry of it. And butterflies and other insects have done some amazing chemistry to create their colors and their patterns. And so there's a lot we can learn from that. Whether we can use it for tattoos, I don't know, but there's a lot of great science there. So my, my question, my next question happens to, has to do with representation. And so this idea that, I, again, Alexi's talking about the sort of representing the dreams, you know, this idea of using pigment from butterflies to, you know, change um, our own pigment, so to speak. So that what that represents. So I guess as all of you look at the film and your involvement in it, what does it represent for you? And, and, and sort of some of the messaging. I, I guess for me, I, I didn't until Alexis, you said this, the idea of immigration and migration, right? For me, the fluidity of the main character sort of moving back and forth between Mexico and oftentimes code switching between the two made me think about the monarch side of trying to having to go between each, con you know, each country and the sort of code switching that they do as they move from one area to the other. So for each of you, in, in terms of this film, beyond even just the science and the butterflies, what did it represent for you? Or what does it call to mind when you watch the film? So I can, maybe I can jump in. I mean, I think one of the things that really struck me in this movie was about you know, being realistic about what it's like to be a scientist. You know, and, and, and the idea, what I, what really, I, I really loved was the, the scene where, you know, the, the young man's made this great discovery, has this big paper coming out, but because for other reasons in his life, he's unhappy. And so you really see that. And, and I think it's great to have that human side to the way scientists are, because again, we have stereotypes of what a scientist is like, but it's like, you know, they're living real lives where the rest of the world impinges on what should be a great moment scientifically, but personally they have other issues. And so I thought, you know, through the whole story, there was this fantastic intersection between the science and the real life of a person. And I thought it was beautifully done in the film. And that's something that, that, that I really appreciated. And just the, the, also the dreamlike quality of it at times though, too, you know, about how he's thinking about his life how it intersects with his science. And, you know, it's fantastic the way he, see, it, he sees like images of his science across the window and things like that. So I think that kind of merger between what a real person's life is like and then what their scientific life. And I think it's great to sort of see that on the screen. Thank you, Nipom. Elodie. Yeah, no, as Nipom was talking, I was thinking, oh, yes, yeah, spot on. You really explained it really well. And what's uh, what was great also is that I, I can imagine the public watching a movie like that and seeing the scientist and thinking, oh, well, that's an unusual characterization of a scientist. But in fact, if you looked at where they actually filmed, they filmed in this institute where he would have been, I mean, if people didn't know this guy was an actor, they would have, he would have been mistaken for a scientist. He looks typical of a scientist. Uh, that, that is what a scientist looks like. So 
that was a, a great depiction. As a scientist watching the movie, to me, that was, you know, accurate to a certain level. Now, the other part that I thought was, you know, Nipam, I really liked how you explained how this was a real, it's a real person with a real life and how science and personal life intersect. But it also depicts really well how science can sometimes be a really lonely endeavor. You see him, you know, alone at his microscope or dissecting and and it, it's not, you know, it, it doesn't look all that exciting, but in fact, you can feel how it's moving internally and in his mind, how things are, are brewing constantly. And that, that is also very typical where on the exterior, it seems very static, but there is a lot going on. Yeah. Absolutely. So the next question, did you want to respond to that, Alexi? Otherwise, I have I a question. For I wanted you. to. I wanted to respond to Elodie because I think it's. It was a good point, and you know, a lot of these decisions, uh, because the film is somewhat biographical. It's somewhat of my, my years, and it, it was a sort of a sol solitary. Um, but I think that um, what's what, what's interesting also about the lab is that it's a sort of like refuge. You know, it's that in the chaos of New York City and. And this urban jungle that he lived in, and, and everything that's happening in his family, he it's a, it's kind of like a safe spot, you know, and um, and he doesn't really bring anybody there. It's almost like his, it's like his his little cove, you know. And so I thought that it was interesting not to emphasize discovery, but just seeing him there at night working, um, and the, just the 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 musicality of of him injecting into the eggs, you know, the butterfly eggs and listening to music and somebody interrupting him. And so that was the idea was to, to really kind of, you know, play on the idea of memory on, on, a, on a space that's kind of neutral and, and it could be anywhere like in limbo. Um, and I thought, you know, of course science is also very collaborative but I think it's an, it's an interesting meditative space as well, yeah. especially when you're looking through microscopes. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I felt it was a, a space of sanctuary so science is almost his sanctuary, that safe space, as you said, Alexis, for him to go where nothing mattered but the science, right? That space that is 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 where we can, go, the, the happy place. And you can travel through time also, right? You can travel through microscopic time. You can, um, and also the, the word sanctuary is interesting because of course you have the butterfly sanctuary. So, yes. um, but I, I also use the lab as a way to go into flashbacks and and memory, um, it's almost like a portal through time, yeah. um, which, is, which is interesting, yeah. So that, that's the perfect segue because the next section, I'm sorry, the next question is from Lee, who wants to know, was there a specific meaning for you, Alexi, in playing with time without being explicit instead of telling the story in a more direct narrative line from past to present? Yeah, I think, I, I think I, it's almost, the film is almost like a like a genetic code. You know, there are different elements that you have to kind of shuffle. It's like it's like comparative genomics. You have to like take these elements and and reshuffle them as rearrange them. And I thought it was interesting to edit the film where um, where there was a bit of you know confusion between time and space. Um, and I also you know it's interesting when people refer to the film as experimental or non narrative because I feel like you know it's ultimately a film about somebody trying to figure out their identity. And so it, it kind of makes sense to have that structure because he is confused and he is merging these worlds and he's trying to figure out what happened, you know, with his, you know, the family trauma. So I, I thought that the structure kind of helped in this like existential um, crisis that, that was happening and, and, um, and kind of this dream reverie type of, type of space. Um, but it was hard. It was hard to picture that film because when I tried it to be more linear to Lee's comment, when I tried to start in Mexico, then New York, it just didn't have the same quality. Um, and, and I felt like I wasn't able to, to get that across. So we had to really, you know, for, for the filmmakers out there, we had to really rewrite the film in, in the editing process. So, um, so yeah. Great. So that actually is a nice segue. The next question from Frederick is, He's curious about the folklore and the rituals they performed with animal spirits. And so maybe you can comment um, a little bit on that because I'd also love for Nipom and Elegy 
to comment on sort of rituals in science, right? So there is across all of this, these rituals that were performed in a more mystic sort of environment, but certainly scientists themselves have their own rituals. Yeah, I mean, I, I can start. I, I think that's an interesting point about the rituals in science because the, the, when the ritual happens, uh, initially Mandel is not, is not part of it. He's, he's an outsider. He's observing it as if it's, as if it's something that is foreign to him and, and not familiar. And at the end, well, not to give away for those that haven't seen the film, but at the end, he, there's more of, a, of him being part of the ritual. The, just like a very short story, the, the actor that plays the friend um, his name is Lacero Gabino. Uh, he plays the friend Vicente. He, we started playing, thinking about his character, and he told me that he wanted to understand a lot about science. He didn't, he didn't want to be this friend that was like, you know, lost in Mexico that didn't understand anything about science. So you may, in the film, he speaks about what happens when you mix human and animal genes. He speaks about spitting in a tube, wanting to learn about his DNA. So there was something about that character where he has that interest in science. But the, the ritual is... Um, is a ritual that came out of a workshop with, with non-actors, people from the community. And the idea was to think about, a, an, an, the, the idea was transformation to turn into animals, but also thinking about, um, because the film is really about death, about coping with death and about, about the cyclical nature of who we are. And, and so, um, so those were, that was just like a one day workshop where we just kind of filmed it as a documentary. And then we ended up using bits and pieces of it um, in the film, but I didn't really want to, recreate a ritual that really exists in Mexico. I wanted it to be more of this like fable, you know? Um, and so it was basically, I was not really the director of that scene. I was kind of like shadowing the actor who was conducting the ritual. And, uh, and we were just kind of going around. And, and the main actor, Tenoch Huerta, was also part of the workshop as well. Um, so, so that's how it came about. And, and I, again, I'm really interested in combining documentary and fiction and, and giving people that are from these communities agency to be part of a film and, and be part of like the fictional part of it as well. You know, it's like, well, we're going to create a ritual and I want, you, I want you all to be part of it. And so we had, these were all people from Michoacan uh, that were, that were part of it. But, um, but yeah, there's definitely a big part of rituals in, in the, in the lab as well. So Nipom or Elodie, do you, did you have anything you wanted to add? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree that, you know, it was, it was, it was great seeing that, that part of the film. And, but then you mentioned about rituals in science. And it's actually kind of funny because I've been involved recently in discussions about making protocols publicly available, but also how do you write a protocol so anyone could repeat it? And then you realize when you're doing that, that you have little rituals that you do with the way you do a procedure. And then you question like, was well, this really necessary or not? But you never change it because that's the way you do it every time, right? And then you pass that along to your students. So I have these like little funny things, like I spin Eppendorf tubes in a particularly strange way, which is a very, very nerdy thing to do. But I always tell people, if you're gonna make it work, you just gotta do it this way. You can screw everything else up, but as long as you do that, it's gonna be fine, you know? And of course it makes no sense, but, um, but it's true that as scientists, we also fall into these little rituals. And then it's interesting to see how we pass them along and how we like write about them. We actually even formalize them into, into procedures that we follow. And then years later, you're, you know, someone will ask you, well, why do you do it that way? And you're like, that. you know, this is, I always show that. So it's the way I do it. <laughs> I always likened scientists to baseball players that when baseball players are having a, a bad hitting day that they change their music before they go to the plate, you know, because again, there's a certain superstition or ritual about, you know, you always do the same things before you, you know, you, you approach the plate. There's a very specific thing that happens. And I think scientists are very much in that same um, vein of thinking. I, so I will, I will so, add, yes. I will add with, because I, when I, when I first spoke with Elodie as well about filming in the genomic center, there was a lot of conversations about, you know, where should we film? Like, what is, what is the, what is like the, the bench that we want to actually film in? You know, what are, what scientists could be part of the film. And so LED came kind of became like a, like a casting director almost. Uh, and also we, we shot a few scenes with LED that didn't make it in the film, not because of, just because my editor. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but you're in the, there's all the, actually there's a, 
we hear Elodie and we hear a lot of people in the background, but, um, but that was really interesting also is kind of like having the scientists be part of, you know, what they thought would be interesting in terms of production design and space. And to, uh, to Nepom's point, you know, dissecting, dissections, you know, everybody has their technique on how to dissect. All of the scenes in the film are real butterfly scientists, Bob Reed, Arnaud Martin. These are real scientists dissecting. The opening scene of the dissection is done by, by, uh, by Bob Reed. And it was, it was high pressure because he had to do a dissection with, with like the cameras and lights and everybody watching him. And so, you know, um, so I think there's, there's also like a really interesting aspect about who's really, who's good at doing these dissections. How do we, how everybody has different techniques. And um, so, yeah. So we have several questions coming in. So I'll try to get to as many of them as I can. But um, I think this one is for all of you. Um, Ajitendra asks, how do you see the role of metaphor in community in communicating such vital topics? Anyone want to take that one? I mean, I can start. Um... I think, you know, especially when you're describing something that, uh, I mean, metaphors are, you know, it's, it's interesting because it's another way of thinking about, you know, we were talking a little bit about fiction, but metaphors is a way of, of creating references, right? So people can kind of anchor themselves and understand things in their own, in their own worlds, in their own kind of understanding. I think what's interesting about fiction is that you can visualize those metaphors, you know? So there's a scene, for example, where, the actor touches the window and he sees the butterfly wing on the window and he kind of imagines it, you know, like the time lapse on the window. And I think film has the, has that beauty of elevating those metaphors into images um, and kind of making them more than just kind of spoken metaphors. But of course, whenever you're describing anything that's, you know, invisible or microscopic, explaining DNA replication and explaining things like, transposable elements, you know, metaphors are so useful to, to get people to understand things that, that are not tangible. And I think, um, I think that's where film is really, you know, is really amazing. And I, most of my work is all about creating metaphors around science and, um, you know, and if you can use countries and people and, and places as metaphors to speak about DNA or speak about, you know, metamorphosis and these types of things, I think, you know, I think it's really, it really kind of, hopefully we'll get people to be inspired, so. I think it, it's also interesting to think about, you know, as, as Alexi was saying, you know, when you're trying to explain things like a micro, you know, something you see in a microscope where it's outside of the normal everyday experience. So you relate it to something that other, you know, otherwise you could understand. But I think also as scientists, this is a little bit maybe tangential, but related is that we also anthropomorphize everything. To, to you know be able to understand it. And I think that's especially true when we think about organisms. We always sort of make them into people and you know and, and talk about them that way and give them purpose and give them all these kinds of things which they probably really don't have, you know and, and we give explanations to their behavior that relate to why we would do that and not why they would do that. you know So like one of the things I work on is like color in butterflies. But then you always have to ask the ask the question: What is the color for? Who is it for? You know, for for us as humans, there's a certain beauty to it, and we see it, and then we see it in our own way with our own eyes. But that's not how other animals see it, and that's and, and we don't really know the function of it. But in order to understand it, we always have to sort of internalize it into the ways that we relate to it. And so I think that that's a, that's a, a really creative thing with the film. Is trying to do that with images that otherwise, how do you relate to them? Awesome. Yeah, and that's you know the best way of communicating your science, right? Is you have to make comparisons that people understand and that are relevant to their lives. So I work on viruses, and so we always say, yeah, that virus, you know, mutated to be you know, stronger, and it wants to do this, it's trying to get away, it's trying to evade, and your immune system is like a little army. <laughs> so, uh, but 
at least you understand the concept of what is happening. So I think that's important uh, to do that in storytelling is you know, to try to relate it to something that is, um, that is relatable. And, you know, I tell my students, there's, there's this guy whose name escapes me, but I, I think he's wonderful who does, um, he's a scientist who now teaches scientists how to not be such scientists when they're telling a story. And he, he wrote a book, and I think his workshop is called Don't Be Such a Scientist. And I think that's immensely helpful for scientists and how they tell their story. I think it's, uh, is it Randy, Randy Olson? Yes, Randy that's Randy Olson. Olson. He's, he's wonderful. I'm like such a big fan of his books. Yeah. Wonderful. And, and, and to Elodie's point, I think metaf metaphors allow us to, and kind of the anthropomorphic allow us to kind of empathize as well, right? Because we, we give them emotion. And so we feel either, you know, affinity or fear, you know, it could be either one. Um, but I think that's also interesting is that you, you kind of create like an emotional um, and I think, you know, it's, it's, it makes us care more, you know, whether it's repulsion or attraction, I think is, is interesting, the whole viruses and army and, and again, you're creating stories. I mean, it's amazing. It's that, that's great. So a couple more questions. So I, I want to read this one, uh, although this is for Alexis, I, I just love the way the the, the, the way Helga um, put this. So Helga asks, how do you arrive at decisions about a successful balance between science info to be conveyed and the emotional slash personal story of human characters? She says it was perfect. Oh, well, that's very nice. Um, I don't know if it was perfect, but um, I, I can say that it's definitely, it comes from like a very genuine, you know, um, that there's a lot of like, you know, I think especially with film, when, when you when you force something, it, it that comes across when you're trying too hard to do something. So there's something about when you're a filmmaker, um, you know, your approach to it is very visible in the product that you make. Um, and so, you know, I'm very kind of humble as I as I speak to like LD and the Palm and and kind of get them to be involved in the film. And I'm just kind of collecting all of these things. But you know, I, I don't necessarily think of my films as being science films per se. I think science is kind of like the music for me. It's like music in the backdrop. And I, and I love using science as like a, a, a way to get into other topics. You know, it's almost like a language to speak about identity and immigration and politics. Um, and I think, you know, I can speak about what's happening in the US or I can speak about the, you know, immigration, but I kind of use science as a way to get to those topics. Um, so it becomes like a language, you know, uh, my, my language. And I also really love scenes where people just speak in scientific terms and you don't necessarily understand what they're saying. I think we need more of that in film because it doesn't matter if you don't understand what they're saying. It's more about kind of focusing on maybe the character is daydreaming and, and, and you know, and, and thinking about something else. So there's a lot of those scenes with, with LD was, was helping me and we had Kristen, one of her students that was presenting and we, you know, it's like real conference, like real lab meetings that were happening and you don't fully understand what's happening, but it's just music, you know, it's just speaking about, you know, gain of function and knockouts and, and, you know, and all of these things. So, um, so I think for me, the science as, as I don't try to make, think about too much that it's a science film. I just, I'm just trying to make a film about, and I'm really interested in characters, you know, what are they going through? And, and, you know, does it make sense to have a dream? Does it make sense to go into science fiction because of the character's journey and, and emotional journey in the film? Wonderful. So this is probably, um, we'll take just a quick answer. So Jennifer asks, will there be a future, will there be a way in the future for educational institutions to access the film and make it available for students and classes? Well, I, I would turn to Elodie and Nepom actually, because I, I'm very interested in myself in, in bringing more film into classrooms and, and research spaces. And not only, you know, learning about protocols and methods, but I think fiction and also teaching, teaching PhD students how to be visual uh, storytellers, I think is really important. Um, not only documenting what they do, but also kind of creating story. I mean, like writing, like scientific publishing. Um, so I think for, just the fact that Elodie and Nepom were part of the film and accepted 
you know, to this crazy idea of making like a fiction movie um, and kind of being advisor on it speaks to on their behalf of, of being open to those ideas. Because a lot of people may be worried about that and say, oh, it, it may dilute the science or it may misconstrue the science. But I think it's really important, especially for young scientists to understand the, the importance of, of visual storytelling in their own work and, and, and for their careers as well. Okay. Now that's the perfect segue to um, what I think will be our last question. Um, and I want to give you guys a chance to, you know, you have your final say, but I think this last question will sort of allow um, us to expand on Alexi's, the, the, the last answer you gave. So just ask from both filmmaker and scientist perspectives, what were some key components that enabled this select successful collaboration between artists and scientists? And any tips and advice for working across fields on such a project? So you wanted one of us to tackle it first? Is that what you're <laughs> doing, Carla? If you like, or again, I would love to give you all kind of your final word. We're at 450, which is sort of our last question and we're winding down. So if you'd like to respond, Elodie, and then sure. if you had some final thoughts on, yep. on, on the experience, that would be fantastic. Yeah, and it is a great setup. That question is a great setup. Yeah. So, it, you know, one, one aspect that is unique here in this movie is that Alexi is both a scientist and an artist. And so he has a leg up for sure. But um, it is, you know, the, there needs to be more of these programs that do allow these types of collaboration. Collaborations. I know NYU has something like that, but um, many scientists are open to having artists reach out to them. Um, you know, people will respond, uh, and I think there is far more interest. Uh, it's just it's trying to get over the uh, sort of the limitation because we're, we're each in our corners and the, um, the intersection is not always that obvious. Some people are more into that intersection like Nipam is because he does a lot of more communication of science, but uh, but I think it's a it's a question of people who are interested in doing that should reach out to to scientists, and I think the National Academy ha is a good place to actually provide some of these links. So that that would be good. And as a, a final thought, and I, I'm thinking more from filmmakers, screenwriters is that it is important that you reach out to scientists and to reach out to the right scientists and. Um, you know, I've, I've read books where the, the fiction is a great story and it's based on a scientific premise, but the scientific premise is so wrong that um, it's, it, it actually kills the story. Um, maybe not for many people who don't understand some of the science. And then when I look at the acknowledgements and I see that who they've used as a scientist and not every scientist is, is the same, right? So, so anyway, so that would be my last thought that it is important that artists reach out to scientists and, and try to do these collaborations. Wonderful. Thank you, Elodie. Uh, Nipah? Yeah, well, one, as I'll reiterate what Elodie said that actually working with Alexis was especially easy because he does have training as a scientist. So we could just sit down and have a conversation where I knew he was following what I was saying and you know, and, and, and that was great. But, you know, also along the same lines. Um, so Alexi was very influential in getting me more involved and in kind of reaching out to the public through his imagined science films, right? So he had encouraged me to, to enter something. But and that and then, you know, but that was purely a visual thing. But then at, at a later point, I got a call from the person who is the director of the Berkeley Art Museum. And he wanted me to do a piece for the art museum. And I was like, Oh, I think you have the wrong Patel. I mean, there's, you know, why are you calling me? And they said, no, 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 I hear you do like, you know, nice imaging. And so we got into this conversation and of course he doesn't have a science background. And so we had this fun exchange about, well, what could we do that would appeal to the public that I might be able to help with? You know, we came up with something that, that I had a lot of fun doing, but I think it's, it, it's that sort of openness 
um, for scientists to think about those intersections and being out there and not being afraid. And, you know, again, you can't get everything accurate. So don't, you know, don't get overworked about that. Um, but I think it's really a, a, an opportunity that more and more people should take advantage of. So, um, and I, and I thank all the people out there that are trying to do these kinds of things now. I think it's wonderful. So Alexi, would you like the, your, your final word on that? Yeah, no, I think, I mean, I, I agree with all that. I think the, the more that we have, you know, pioneers doing this, the more it's going to be things that we can kind of establish as being more kind of formalized. And I think what's also interesting is that it's a very symbiotic relationship, right? So that the artist may help the science, you know, it's not like one is serving the other one. Um, and the science may also help the art. And so it's not so much, you know, that scientists need to communicate their research and collaborate with artists, but they're actually, the artists may help understand some aspects about the science that otherwise they wouldn't have. And I, and I think, you know, bringing, um, bring, and I would say that they're very similar in many ways, those, those two worlds, um, being an artist and being, I mean, for me, my life as a scientist kind of, you know, forged my, my the way I think as a filmmaker, you know, how I, how I do research, how I write scripts, how I then put together scenes and create, I mean, all of that was due to my, my doctoral years as, as a PhD student. And of course, there are many programs. I mean, the Sloan Foundation is, is one of them, you know, that kind of embraces also this idea of, you know, celebrating fiction in, in science and collaborates with many universities like, you know, um, like NYU, for example, and Columbia and, and other ones. And then there's you know, the Simons Foundation also does amazing things in terms of helping these collaborations. And there's, you know, and there's also, so I think, you know, I think there needs to be, but I would say, you know, especially from, I would say from head of labs and people that are in positions of like running labs, if they can help bring some of these artists and have maybe like artists in residence programs and just bring them into the labs, which is, can be a very intimidating space to enter into that space maybe collaborate with a postdoc or a PhD student, I think that would be great, like fellowships. And, um, and for me, because I'm a sort of a retired scientist, no longer, every film that I make allows me to like enter into a different field and, and kind of live my dream of, you know, or like my regrets of leaving science too young, so. <laughs> Uh, but I want to first, I want to thank Jess for that amazing last question. We could not have asked a, we could not have placed a better question if we had tried uh, to end on. I'd, I wanna thank the panelists um, for taking your time and uh, being so responsive to the questions from the audience and giving wonderful um, feedback and um, your insights into this. Uh, Alexi, for a wonderful film, and I hope that people who have not yet seen the film, that you'll have a chance to see it. Because as you can see, as we've talked, there are so many aspects to it that I think will resonate with so many people. And so I'm now going to turn it over to Anne and Rick. Thank you very much. And I'm just going to echo what you already said, Carlos, so eloquently. That's right. Thanks to all of you. And thank you, of course, Alexi, for, for making the film and giving us all a reason to be here. Um, and for those of you who have not had a chance to see it, um, and if you are a subscriber to HBO Max, you can um, watch the film on November 2nd, right, Alexi? Do I have that correct? Day of the Dead. Yes. Dia de los Muertos, November 2nd in the U.S. on, on HBO Max, yeah. Cool, that's right. So I, I am a subscriber, but I've already seen the film. Doesn't mean I can't see it twice though. So um, so I'll mark that on my calendar and you should also mark it on yours. And we um, will- And sorry, one go, quick thing. Go. We also had many kind words for Alexi. Alexi, I put them in the chat. I don't know if you had a chance to look at it, but I let everybody know that I did that. So thank you in particular, Eric and Sheila for saying nice things about the movie. Sorry, yes. <laughs> no, that that is well worth the interruption. And I'm glad that you did, because I, I was only going to say that, you know, we thank everyone for being here in our audience as well, because we are grateful to those of you who continue to dial in to our programming. And we will, of course, be back again next week. Um, so, Rick, we have we have Abby Marsh on our stage next week with Brian Fuller, correct? 
Yeah, so Abby Marsh studies empathy and psychopathy, and Brian Fuller uh, is, was the showrunner of Hannibal, among many other great credits. What could possibly go wrong? This is going to be a great conversation. Please tune in next week for that. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. That's right. So, so uh, next Wednesday, uh, 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific, we will be back, and we hope we see you there. Look for the invitation in your inbox. Sachi will make sure it's there. <laughs> All right, thanks, everybody. See you next week. Happy Bye. Happy birthday, Dad. <laughs>